topic is reactive programming, given by Emmanuel Gardunio. Emmanuel is a senior systems analyst at Genworth Financial, and Genworth is our meeting sponsor for the evening. Um, is there anybody here that's new in the group, or anybody who's here for the first time? Welcome, welcome. Um, I'd like to introduce Roman and Barry. Roman's in the back, and he is our uh, social media person who does the social media for the Jedi. And then Romans, and then Barry is a uh, University of Richmond professor, and he's our host. I'm Collins, and I'm your meeting facilitator for the evening, and every evening. Um, there's a sign-in sheet here. Is anybody not signed in? We have a raffle at the end. Awesome. Um, after the meeting, we go to um, the tavern. I'd love to have everybody join us for some networking afterwards. And uh, they're located behind the Exxon at Three Chops and Patterson in the Triangle Shopping Center. Um, so I'd like to introduce Andrew Frank with Genworth, our sponsor. That's exciting. <laughs> so the worst part of any of these events is actually the beginning part, so I'll make it really quick because you all are not here to hear me at all. But I'm the IT recruitment manager with Genworth, uh, so we are always happy to support events like this throughout Richmond, and, and obviously I love supporting events like this because I'm, I'm an IT guy, so it's helpful. But uh, just wanted to let you guys know that obviously Genworth is here in Richmond, a lot of people don't really know about us, even though we're headquartered here. It's our corporate headquarters globally. We're in 25 countries, but this is our, our headquarters right here in Richmond. So a lot of folks don't know that. If you're looking for jobs, let me know. I will not make you uh, take a card, or, or I won't steal a sheet to contact you. But if you want to contact me, I'll leave some cards up here. You can grab them uh, and reach out to me if, if you'd like to. Um, I'm going to go a little different here. I'm going to put Shittam on the spot, who's also with Genworth. He actually replaced Roman at Genworth, so uh, we're, we're very we're very incestuous here. Clearly. Um, so I'm going to make him say, "What are three exciting things your team is working on right now at Genworth?" Hey, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Andrew. Uh, exciting to be here. I started three months back. I think I think the digital transformation is probably the first and foremost. I think the cornerstone for that are. The, you know, it started with Roman being there. That's how it started. I think that's the first thing. It's the digital transformation, not looking at it just as how do we support websites, right? That's not that's not the point. Right? So that's kind of the first thing. The second one that really Manny and Peyton here is kind of working on is really uh, our work with Angular, what we're doing with our some of our transactional sites, looking at Angular, and that's the second one. And the third one is on the content side. We, we've invested uh, on, um, you know, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Adobe CQ or Adobe EDM platform. So we invested heavily on it because uh, that's where our marketing content is being delivered from. There's some innovation that's happening there. So those those, those three are being the three key areas that I've seen we've done really well in the last few months. So you, you all heard what I like to hear, which is a company investing time, money, and effort into fun stuff. So that's not everywhere. So again, there's my little pitch. Manny will take over from here. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Yeah, so I'm going to start with uh, functional programming. Functional reactive programming, it's important to mention that reactive piece of that statement. So how many of you have used uh, Alex Java? It's a project from Netflix. So at least hear about that project. It's, I must admit, not many people and, and yes. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this, because it's a very powerful tool, a library, and also the functional reactive programming piece of that is also very, very important. So that, that's part of this. Uh, demonstration. My goal is that by the end of this presentation, you're going to see that complex projects, not, not projects, but complex uh, uh, issues of, that you can face with pairing uh, uh, synchronous calls, things like that, can be really implemented with this library, uh, following the functional reactive principles that uh, are coming along with this Alex Java from Netflix. So, well, I'm Manuel Gartuno, I'm Mexican, I'm a father, so I love video games, that's all about me, that's all about me, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> you would like, you, you, you would like to talk about video games, I'm happy to. <laughs> so I want to start with some Java facts, and this is going to, uh, to be, it, it might look bad, I'm not saying Java is bad, just uh, I want to, because it's about function, functional programming, I want to, to make some statements about Java. 
So the first one is that Java is not a functional programming language. So how you can apply a functional style, a style of programming to Java that is going to be part of this conversation. Lambdas in Java 8 are not functions, like closed source and method references are not functions. So it, those are just methods. In, in Java, we have all the oriented programming, so we have to have a class, and that class is going to have a method, then the method might be a function. But we don't have functions in Java. It, like I said, it is possible to use functional style of programming in, in, in Java. One of those is Guava. It's a, it's a very nice library. It used to be Commons Collection, but then Guava kind of, from Google, improved everything that Commons Collection did, and now we have Java 5 features that Commons Collection did not have. And so that's why Guava is getting uh, really popular now, now, nowadays. So to talk about functional reactive programming, I'm going to first uh, strike the reactive piece of that and just talk about functional programming. And there are some principles of functional programming. I'm not listed everything. There are some jobs that I think it's important to mention in this presentation. Uh, one of those is data in, data out. When we think about functions, a function of x may get an input parameter, and then the output parameter is just maybe a different value of x. And that's really what a function is doing. Functions in mathematics are really simple. It's just you have an input parameter, there's an output parameter. So it's data in, data out. And that is very important about functional programming, and you're going to see some examples why is that, that is important. Uh, the second one is immutability. And I like to ask this question all the time when I talk about immutability. Uh, why do you think immutability is a good concept of programming in general, not just about or clear functional? Anyone who would like to answer that? Easy to reason about. Hmm? Easy to reason about. You can, there's not too many moving parts. Yeah, but for sure, yes, code is more readable. But I think there's one uh, more important thing about immutability. Like, no side effects. Yeah. Correct. Per safety, no side effects. Because that piece of code or that object is immutable, <coughs> then multiple players can use it and you don't have issues. You're, you're not a state. You're not changing a state. So that is fine for a, a parallelism, parallelism or a multiplayer. So that's why immutability is important. And the other piece is lazy evaluation. So this is the only topic where you can say I'm lazy and that's okay. It's cool <laughs> to be lazy. Uh, the reason of that is because when you are lazy, you, do, you are not spending resources that you don't need at that time. You just basically, when, when you need that, it, it's on demand. So uh, for high level availability system, it's really important because you are not consuming or wasting resources. Then the declarative style. Java is imperative and declarative at the same time. You tell what to do. And with some library, you can say, uh, uh, you are not, declarative means that you are not telling how to do it. You are just telling this is what you have to do, and you have to do it. Imperative means you have to do this. So uh, in functional programming, that is important as well. And finally, strong typing. Java is strong typing. <coughs> that's the only thing I want to mention about that is that you have, you have to type things. Classes define all of your type. type. Like I was saying, what's a function then if we're going to talk about functional programming is this a, 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 picture, a picture from Wikipedia, you have an input and you have an output. A, a f of x is going to represent something. <coughs> like a, a, a square root of 9 is going to be 3. All the time you call that function, it's going to be the same result. So that's why it says always represent the same output or the same input. And that's very important for functional programming. And just like I said, it doesn't matter in what context you are calling a square root of 9, it's all, always going to be 3. If that is running in a multiplayer environment, it, it doesn't matter, it's going to be the same result for the same input, the same result. And that is uh, uh, going to happen in function, uh, functional programming. So, and this is just like some, again, because Java is not a functional programming language. In Java, you have to, to have classes, and the classes have methods. Then it's just some kind of, in theory, we don't have a functions in Java. If we want to do it right, and this is just my opinion, and you don't have to have a state. That means that function, functions should not have or modify instance variables. Also, functions should not have or, or, or access or modify class variables. That means static fields or access static methods. And the last one is try to not, to not modify the environment. So if you have, you have a function that receives an input parameter, then the only thing that you have to do is express <coughs> that input parameter. To process a result, or don't change something else in that call. 
uh, again talking about immutability and less, uh, less complete learning and less safety, this is important as well because you are just focusing on what the function is going to do, get that input parameter, process the data, and then get that back out. So what that don't mention like is in practice that is not very easy to implement. And the reason again is because Java is object oriented. So uh, in Java there is no functions are not case class sequences. You cannot declare a function. So when you try to create functional programming, the code could, might look really, really messy. And then you're gonna see an example of that. Even Guava is telling me that, that be careful about functional programming when you, when, you want, you, when you try to implement functions in Java. And again, uh, just because I'm going to talk about this, that it, it doesn't mean that it's a solution for everything. It's just a solution for some issues that we have in, in web development. But it's good to have, I love functional programming, I love Groovy, so, all the examples that you're going to see in this presentation are with Ruby. You have some questions about Ruby, just ask me because there is a lot of typing that you say, you say, and that might be a little bit tricky if you are not familiar with Ruby. But uh, if you have questions, just ask me. Okay, and when you see a, an icon like that, it's because I'm going to uh, do some coding. So, in this case, I have an editor kit. And the first thing I'm going to show is. This is what I was saying. We have, ah, this is too loud. Okay, I think we can do it better. So this is a, a, a class where I, I just want to define two. I'm gonna call functions. Again, Java is not a functional program, but I'm gonna call them functions. Well, well, we're gonna define two functions, add and multiply. And then I need to wrap that in, in, in a class. And basically what I'm doing is just asserting that if I add 10 plus 10, so therefore this 20 in the same time multiply two for f, two by uh, uh, by 10 is 20. So I'm, I'm, it's just working now, it's just an assertion. But what I was uh, saying about functional programming is that this is data in. I'm processing something and then it, this is just data out. So this is a good example of, of, of a function. But because this is Java, we can say, well, that function is not using any state. It might be a static, right? We can easily change that by static method, and then if we see that, then we can say maybe this is final. And maybe I want to hide the private, so I want to hide the, uh, the constructor. So that's what I say. I said in Java, it's not easy to have functions because you have all that around the function. That it's not important for functional programming, but that you have to code, and, and, and that is just an example. Well, I mean, what when should I want to do? So now we have a static method that means that I don't have a, I don't need a reference. I can just call. So it's an example about how Java may see functions. So the next example is with Java. So also that's a lot of code. And what we're trying to do with this, uh, in this is basically we have a, a and again this is Ruby's different question. The first thing is just an array, an array of maps. So the uh, the solution that we are trying to present here is uh, iterate to that array, find uh, and filter that array by color, where the where the color is blue, and then transform that and give me the price. So it's something that we do all the time. In our, in, our, uh, in our coding. Basically, we have a collection. We iterate that collection and then we apply some rules, like in this case, called a predicate. I want to filter that collection by something. And then I want to transform that report into something else. And this is, yes, yeah, some, some kind of functional parameters. We're applying functional parameters to Java. Yeah. So this is what I was telling you that it might be easy to read, okay? But what, what if you're doing a little bit more than that? Then it can get complicated because we have a predicate, which is a class, wrapping a function, and then a function that is a class wrapping a function. But in reality, then, then this function has an input parameter and output parameter. The predicate is still a function, just that the output parameter is Boolean. And let me execute this to show you for what's saying, okay, I, I'm, I'm, I want all the items that are color blue, and then just give me the price. I have two, it's this one, and this one. Uh, but let's, I want to start 
removing some of the things that we really don't need to do. Another important about that function that I'm just going to keep. The same result, and this looks much better. This is grooving, this is functional priming. So it's the same result, but it's not readable. You're saying that, okay, I'm filtering. But it is just saying that, it is assuming that that is the only parameter that this closure is getting, this function is getting. So okay, give me the color, and the same thing, so it's more readable. And this is where functional priming is great, but again, in Java, it might be a little bit tricky. So that's just an example that, things that, uh, that you may face when you try to implement functional priming in Java. <coughs> I don't know if you have any questions about functions. I, again, generally just that idea, what is a function? Now the next piece is, let's forget about functions, or functional, and we start talking about reactive programming. So, okay. So, there is a, a group of people, like in many other uh, design patterns and ideas, like domain-driven scientists, driven development. In this case, there is a reactive manifesto. They define what a, a, a reactive system might be, or how, how a reactive system may behave. So in that manifesto we have that it has to be responsive, responsive is the top in the item, and that is important to talk about response <coughs> and why. Then you have polarizing, which is elastic, which is really elasticity or, or scalability, and then resilience. I hope I say that right, but uh, the system has to be resilient, it has to be able to recover from errors. And then all that, uh, and that communication between all those principles is basically driven by, in some cases, let's say events, or in some cases, let's say, let's say messages. But in, in reality, it's maybe a, a message is an abstraction of an event, it's just more generic. A message can be an error, a message can be just an item, a message can be a sequence, it doesn't matter, you just, uh, 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 what, what they define events or messages. So, I just keep it what, what they have in the uh, reactive manifesto, and I'm going to explain what I understand about that and what is my opinion about being responsive. And really being responsive means that <coughs> even if there are failures, even if there are issues with performance, and it depends what kind of issues you may have, but you, your application should be able to, to respond back to a, to a client. So maybe there was an issue with one of the uh, uh, backend services that you are using, but that doesn't mean that your application should, should, should go down. Just because one dependency is out, you should still be able to, to call that a, a, a service and get a, a response back. So basically, you're just saying that, and the, the, the part I like is that responsive system focuses on providing rapid and consistent response time. So again, it doesn't matter if it's application, if one of the backend dependencies is out, you obviously have to reply with something. That something might be, okay, this is an error, but it should not bring down the, the whole application. So. Uh, one of the reasons to have to have responsive at the top is because, like the last statement says, when your when your server is available, if you're not responding by phone, then I have no idea what's happening. It's just not available. Then you have more confidence about your user. You are handling errors better, and then <coughs> your application is more stable. And this is something that we have tried to implement at Django. Like uh, like Shadam said, it's, it's it's really cool that we can implement things like that in a company. Uh, resilient, and the next one is. Okay, we know that we're using HTTP and that's the web. HTTP can have latency issues, can, the, the network may go down, the person may have issues, you may have firewall uh, issues, blah, blah, blah. There are a lot of issues that can happen around the HTTP protocol. So what does it mean to be resilient? In one of those calls, in one of those systems, like I was saying, responsive, something is going to fail. We need to understand that failure is part of our web system or system in general. Something is going to fail, it's not going to be up, even if we say, it's going to be over 91, 1%. That 1% that is late is a lot of time. We consider that one year. So 
So something is going to fail. Well, what happens if that fails? The system should, should recover from that failure. It can be an internal failure, maybe they said uh, that there is a database connection, and for some reason that database connection, uh, maybe the database was shut down or there was an issue in the data center. That doesn't mean that the application should go down because that database is down. As long as the data, once the database is coming back up, you should be able to recover from that and just connect. You don't need to bounce anything, you don't need to restart any server because that happened. So that is that's what actually I mean. Okay, there was failure, we need to understand what happens and then we have to recover. So um, and I'll like I say this is coming from an exit, so you're gonna see the high availability uh, or critical systems all the time. They process tons, tons of information, they uh, stream video, and uh, I'm gonna show you some example of Kislik, that's another Nexty library, they say that they, they run like thousands of threads in their servers. They run in Amazon Web Services, so uh, I will I encourage you to read about that because it's amazing what they can do with this library. And Jenwood is not that big, but applying what they do in a small company is helpful. It's just, you're just following the biggest uh, uh, writers in IT, like Facebook, Nexty, so that's why I love uh, Alex Java. Okay, last pick. This is about performance uh, and scalability or uh, uh, basically when your system has issues, maybe and you have a lot of load on your server, maybe there are transactions that are slow, and the system should be able to react to that. Like for example, maybe uh, you're consuming a lot of threads in the HTTP layer, maybe you're connecting, uh, you're using a Tomcat or any uh, JBoss uh, server, and then you're connecting and reusing those HTTP connections that are coming into your server for a request when they are using that connection as to go internal or out to a different system, like a third party system. So you are wasting resources and, and, and consuming uh, threads that the server needs to use to, uh, to respond to a server request. In this case, what you can do is define groups of thread pools just for some specific components of your application. Like I was saying, maybe you know that there is a, a, a a backend that has a lot of demand, you may say, okay, I want to have 20 threads dedicated to this specific dependency or backend. I want to have 25 threads dedicated to this other dependency. I want this sort of dependency to time out in one second. I want this sort of dependency to time out in three minutes. That's all up to you. And that is part of this scalability. You can say how you want to dedicate resources to what particular pieces of your infrastructure. And that's the power of being uh, elastic. Elasticity. And something that is important about this is that it says in a cost effective way. So, like in the example I was giving, I was uh, uh, giving, maybe a system is down, and just because that system is down doesn't mean that you're going to spend, spend resources trying to connect to the system, trying to connect to the system, and then that means that you have stock threads. Well, that stock threads are not <coughs> good because it might be, you may be getting a lot of memory error. So that is because important. If you are going to be elastic because maybe there is an error, then it has to be efficient. You, you cannot, uh, even if you are saying, okay, I'm gonna have a pool of 100 threads, it has to be efficient. So you need to coordinate and think about how you want to dedicate resources to what pieces, <coughs> because if not, then you're gonna have the same issues. And the last one is message uh, living, like I said, is just that a system rely on asynchronous messages. It doesn't have to be asynchronous all the time, it's just that, again, because it's coming from a uh, network, <coughs> they think about asynchronous like every day. So it's something, it's a record requirement that they have. Alex Java allows you to, to write synchronous and asynchronous code. It's almost identical when you are writing, it's just how they behave and how you react to those uh, uh, different uh, uh, issues. So, uh, this is what they use to communicate, like I was saying, maybe it's, a, it's event driven, it's just a message. When there is a failure of trying to communicate, okay, something fell, how you want to react to that? Like example, again, maybe this backend is out, what you can do, I'm going to let this history application that, don't call that backend again in maybe one minute. Because I don't know it's done, I don't want to spend the process calling that backend. Just wait one minute and then call it again. So it's part of the messaging that goes. And, and that's like I said, it can be an error, it can be, an object, it can be an event, it depends. So it's depending on what you want to achieve with a method driven architecture. 
a question. With the messages, um, so if you have multiple components, is, I guess are the messages only within like one system, or like if you have multiple components, like two servers running at like different like applications or whatever, do the mess can you send messages between them? I, well, I'm just not sure it, what they. This talks about like a system. Um, okay. You can think of a system as just one instance. Okay. And there are many uh, things that you can do to to achieve that kind of uh, functionality, like microservices or uh, how you communicate between different systems. Okay. But in general, the idea is that in that application, that, that component, you can coordinate with messages or events. Okay, and so is it similar to like an event bus almost, or? Um, I, kinda. Um, I don't want to say yes, because okay. an event bus, like for example, in Guava, you can use event bus. Mm -hmm. You can basically define, okay, this is the object, and this is the, uh, the item I'm putting in that channel, and then listeners of that event is, uh, sorry, listeners of that channel are just going to take that item and do something with it. True. In this case, it's similar. It's just that they are using the observer pattern. Okay. And I'm going to show that as well. Okay, and, and then that observer pattern is used, well, the observer work is used on the place in the library. Okay. okay, so now we know, kind of, hope that I did, I did that right, what is functional reactive programming. Really, functional is a programming piece. Reactive is how people in that community say, this, this is how a, a reactive system should be. So, so that's the idea. Okay, getting to, to the library. Again, this is taken from uh, from uh, the GitHub where there is a, a have the project. All this is open source. So I think it's really cool from Nexus that all these kind kind of tools they use internally are open source, which is great. Uh, they said it extends the observer pattern to support sequences of data events. And there are multiple operators that you can use in that sequence. They, they also call it observable sequence, again, because it's using the, the server pattern. And then, like I, like I was saying, you can use that sequence of that library to, be, to write asynchronous code, synchronous code, bit let's say, multi-threading is, is really powerful. And this is just to remind what is the observer pattern. We have an, any simple, and I know it's so simple, but it's really powerful. You have an observer, and then you have a subject. Uh, the, the observer is going to observe on that subject. It's going to subscribe to that subject. There are many words around Java, so. Uh, the observer is going to subscribe to the subject, and then there's a subscription between that observer and the subject. But really, the, the one that is notifying about things that are changing in the environment is the subject. It's the one always going to say, okay, something changed. It might be, like I was saying, an issue, it, can, it might be an event. It's going to notify all of, of the, all that collection of observers that something happened, and then the observer is going to react to that. Similar to what you said about the event boost, there is just a channel, there is something in that, and there are the listeners of that event, and they just do something about it. So, but I didn't want to say yes because they use observer. That was the only reason. So I have code for that as well. So this is a hello world, the hello world is really simple. They have the observable. Uh, <coughs> and then that from is like in Guava, you have the from, from a collection, it just, that is the observable collection of the sequence of events that, and that observable is going to emit to the subscriber. I know that sounds like, I hope it's clear, but so that's basically what is happening in that piece of code. So we have the observer one that, that from is going to return an, obse an observer server, and then you, you subscribe to that. And what the other thing is going to do is, well, bring welcome Java git. That's it, welcome Java git. That, that's simple. But it's going to start getting interesting. Now. So what about that Guava uh, example that we had before? We can do the same with um, with this library. We have observable from items. They're like fluent observable from. Then you filter that by color, filter that by price, and then finally map. Map is just a transformation, and different libraries call it uh, different. But basically, saying I have this input, give me something different about that. In this case, you just say, okay, I have the map that has a price. I want I to return that as a double. 
And finally, the, the thing that you're going to say is different with the WABA example is that this is going to zoom the prices of those items that are matching this, uh, uh, this filter. So right now you're just saying uh, one is eight because I'm, I'm saying I'm thinking all the items that uh, the color is blue and where the price is less than 10 for if I do something like that. Then it's just assuming 12, 90 plus eight is 29. So again, a simple example that uh, proves what is similar to what again functions. And the other thing that I want to share about it is that we said in one of the uh, uh, statements uh, the principles about functional programming is that it's lazy loaded, it's declarative. So what if I don't subscribe to that? It's not doing anything. Because it's just declaring, defining what you have to do. Until you subscribe to that object, it's lazy, it's going to do something. Until you subscribe to that observable, it's going to emit that sequence. So now we're saying it's lazy and that is declarative. Well, that is, uh, that is using, the, uh, uh, you can create observables in many different ways. That is just a sequence. In this case, we're going to create an observable. And when you create an observable, it's a little bit tricky because you have to, again, it's the observable, but then you have to say, okay, I have a sequence. I need to notify each observable, sorry, each observer of that event. And then when I'm done with that, Processing that sequence, I need to say, okay, I'm complete. So you have a, a three information that you can pass to the observer on error, on complete, and on next. So again, an error can be a message, or like an on ne on next is just that item in that sequence, and on complete is saying, I'm done. So if you think about that, that sounds like promises. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with JavaScript, but Basically, in JavaScript, you can return a promise, and the promise can say, okay, when you are done, execute this. If, you, if there is an error, then execute this. Uh, if there is an, a, a, I don't remember the, the directory, I forgot the last one. But basically, you have that option to say how you want to react to that result once you make a call, like an Ajax call. You get the result of that JSON, and you can say, okay, that failed, execute this, this function. If, if there is a, a if this was success, then execute this function. Ah, the, the other I forgot is always. Always do something. Even if it fails, do something. In this case, it's the incomplete. <coughs> so again, it's really powerful what we can do with this library because it's declarative. You are letting the observer handle the error the, the way they want to do it. If you want to have, you want to an exception when something fails, you can do it. If you want to maybe fall back on that exception, you can do it. But it's not run. It's not run an exception. You just you are defining what you want to do in that on error. So you're saying that we're complete, that's always run uh, regardless of an exception. So yes. you have the only exception yes. you put okay. in one complete code. Yes, yes. always. Yes, and I, and I will assure that. All complete runs regardless of the exception. Okay. And one other thing I want to show you is that when well, you have a subscriber, that subscription, you make basically saying, I want to uh, uh, listen to uh, your event, the subscriber. And when you create an observer, you have to do that. Like, if this subscriber unsubscribe, I mean, if this is still listening to something, if, if that subscriber is not listening, then what I bother to emit that event? Again, it's trying to be, uh, don't spend resources when, do, when you don't have to. So oh, if this is a serious subscriber, then just continue and then notify that it's complete. I wanted to show this too. So just because we have one subscriber and that is going to print welcome Java Gips doesn't mean that the next subscriber is not going to get anything. It's going to get welcome Java Gips because in this case I'm printing everything in one line. But you have that twice. That's a behavior that by default the library executes. Basically you are saying you have emitted events, that's fine. There is another subscriber. I want you to notify about all the events that you can emit. That's what it's doing right here. There is another option that you may say, okay, this is emitting three events, and I have one subscriber, and then I have another subscriber coming in 
for those events already admitted, maybe I'm admitting a new event. That subscriber may get that only last event. So that's a different way to maybe let's think about that maybe in a chat application. We have a chat and there are messages between people, and there is one person that is joining the chat. We want to show the last 10 messages of that conversation. Why we want to show the whole conversation? That's an example. You can do that with your library. You may say, I want to give the full sequence of observables, so it's just pieces of that. In this case, that's why it's just replicating the same, that is the full sequence. With that example where you have the two subscriptions, like are there any like race conditions where it could print out in different orders? Right, uh, that's yeah. a, a good oh, question. And sorry. by default, Alex Java thinks that everything is asynchronous, like what I was saying. In this case, there is no race condition, and the reason is that when you subscribe, you are not using threads. <coughs> that means that you are blocking. It's not that you are specifically calling block, there is a way to block. Mm -hmm. It's just that it is running the same thread, so it's blocking. In this case, it's blocking with the print, and then it's not finished, and then it's blocking with the print. But that is, that is something that you have to realize as well. Because they think that everything is asynchronous. If you don't block when you are using threads, then you may think, well, what is happening? Is that you are not blocking, you have to block like a wait or join in some cases if you, if you use threads. So this is another way to use uh, threads. This is, uh, this is groovy, so it's really easy to start a thread. It's just a closure around that start. And it's the same example. And this is, this is what I said. Why am I not getting the things? Because that, now this is using a thread. I need to block that, so that, that, that statement wait, waits until that observable will complete. So the way to do that is, okay, I follow one thing, yes. When you block, the result of that blocking is a different object. Is and I instead of saying something wrong, I'm gonna uh, show what it is. Blocking observable. If I don't, don't use block, the class is observable. So that's why it was failing. I was trying to use something that was not available in blocking observable. So when you have a blocking observable, the subscribe doesn't make sense because, again, they, they, they think that by default everything is, is asynchronous. In that case, I can just wait. It's using a thread, but it's waiting until that thread completes, and then I'm just saying, okay, go over that sequence, and then you just use, I'm doing the same thing. It's just an hour using threads. But anyway, you know those, one of the questions that we have about uh, threads is that how you can handle timeouts and do you have a thread rule? I don't want to start 100 threads just because I can't run this code 100 times. And then, then there is something in Java that is called uh, executor. Basically, you can define thread rules, then define time to leave, and things like that. And the next example is about executor. So, I have the executor, executor which is defining a, a fixed thread pool of three. That means that you cannot use more than three threads. Then I'm using the same, uh, uh, I'm building the observable in the same way. The only thing that is new is flat map. Flat map, what he's just basically saying is that I'm going to return a collection of observables. Map was just transforming an object. Flat map is saying, okay, I have an input which is text and I'm going to return something that is an observable. It's not an item, it's an observable. And the next thing I'm going to do is use that executor to submit something in this case is just the text. And again, I have to block because uh, this is using thread. And I'm getting the same result. I can prove that this is using, uh, is using that thread tool by just maybe printing You can see using thread one, thread two. <coughs> now 
are using that executable. So it's, it's a better and nicer way to, to use less. And you can see that, that now, because I'm using observable <coughs> from future, then I don't have to, to worry about on, on complete, on error, on next, things like that that I was doing in the previous, which is more con consistent and, and, and easy to use. I don't know if you have any questions so far. And, and there are many ways to create less, like I was saying, it can be, sorry, observables, like in this case, it's just creating from a future. But you can create a, a, a observables from objects or sequences. So what would happen if you change the new fixed thread pool to two? Okay. If you're using the other one. Okay. okay. Just check. Okay, but this library should do more than just that, use next to it. Why would have to write a lot of code? There is another tool that you can, another utility from, from Arif Java, is just a sync, a start, and then that is just the item that is going to emit. It's the same result, so let's do the same thing here. And you can see that the thread names are different. And, and, you, and I'm not going to talk about that, but you can configure that in Rx Java. So basically, there is a different schedulers or pools where your objects run. In this case, it's using the computation thread pools. And there are like four different pools. I'm not going to talk about that, but just be aware that in this case, I'm not defining that. That executor that I was using is not here because of that. And I think library is just doing that for me. And you can, depending, like for example, I can talk a little bit about that. One of those is when you want to do I.O., you can do I.O. blocking or not blocking, then here's if you're going to use a different thread pool for I.O. operations. In this case, you're using a computation thread pool. Uh, so what if we have one observable that is trying to return the same thing, welcome, Java git? Or the second item is, is, is going to fail. If, does something happen? Like we were saying, we have a sequence where maybe one or two or five and fail. In this case, I'm just returning a closure, and that closure is going to draw an exception. And, and this, I'm just executing that closure for returning the string. Again, this is groovy, so I don't know if it's too, it, it's hard to understand, but uh, what I'm doing here is, is like what I was saying with the promises. I have this observable, and then I can do on, on error, resume next. This time I'm telling this observable, instructing this observable that when there is an error, I have a fallback. A fallback plan. My, my plan is to execute that other observable. In this case, because the second item fell, I don't have Java. It's just saying welcome. And then the second observable is going to emit two functional reactive programming. And then this is the last result. And then, like, I, like I was saying, maybe you have a dependency with a backing system and that backing system is failing, but you want to fall back with something else. You, you just don't want to draw an exception. You may fall back with that. And, and there are different uh, ways to do that, uh, that. So again, I encourage you to go to the library and read a little bit more if you're interested. But, uh, but it's really powerful what you can do. Uh, like in this case, just fall back with uh, something different because the second item is failing. There is one more on error return. Because the observable sequence is a closure, then I need to have a closure. In this case, the second one fell, and then what we're saying, if there is an error, then return this. And, and that is welcome Java. And this, that's another example of how you can instruct the observable to, to do a certain thing. And again, because another of the principles was immutability. That means that I can call this many times and I'm not affecting the origin, origin of the robot, so I just call. It's failing because I'm not doing anything with the error. I'm just 
defining this on error return next, we're going to return a near observable, is not modified in the current observable. It is going to return a near observable in, in which I'm going to use for each. In this case, I'm not doing anything, so it's failing. The, the code is just failing. There's something that happened, and I don't know how to react to that. It's just going to fail. Okay, I need to go back to the presentation. So this is what I've been talking about is, they call it defend your app, and, and, and yes, it's, it's really nice what you can do with that. It's basically, last time we have popular and library, designed to isolate, and that is basically the main, the main piece of this is isolating components and system. Uh, so if something, and I, I've, been, I've been saying this a lot, if one of the uh, independence that you have in your system is down, that means that you can, your whole system should not go down, you can do something about it. So this is what this library does. And this is a, a, a figure that represents that. You have a user request that has three dependencies. Okay, dependency A has 10 thread pools, sorry, 10 threads in that pool. Dependency B has only five in that pool. And then dependency I, it has five. So what it's saying is that it's rejecting connections. Why? Because maybe we said that dependency I <coughs> is going to reject connection if in one minute, two calls to that dependency fail. So then he's like saying, okay, I'm not going to spend resources trying to call you again. I'm going to fail fast and then reject any connection to that. I'm gonna try again in one minute, and if that connection is working, then I'm going to continue making calls to that dependency. In this case, it's just saying, failing fast. I'm going back to the code. It's the same example, but again, this has to be simple. The only thing that I need to do is use that command, pass the same text, and return an observer. So now all that about the subscriber, all that about how you create observer is wrapped into that command. So basically you can execute anything that you want inside that command, and you're gonna get the benefits of this library. I'm using the blocking again because this, this observer, by definition, is asynchronous. I'm going to put that in a different uh, thread. Well, that is because this is is loading properly. So basically it from Java Gips is the result, the result of that. Uh, let me do another change. We said that flat map is for observable, but map is for objects. And I'm gonna change observer to execute. And this is essentially what it's going to do is, okay, you want you don't want to use observer, that means you don't want to use text. Execute is going to block action return text. That, that is how easy it is to change between saying I want to use less, I don't want to use less. It's the same command, just a different method. But the, the behavior, behavior is a little bit different. So that what I'm saying is really powerful library. You want to use, you can you can tell your mom, I'm using less. I'm writing a multi plane system, which is really hard to do, but this is really simple. Okay, so I'm going back to the that's really all I have. Now the next thing I'm going to show is a demo, how you can implement. I'm going to put, a, a, to a state up a, a problem, and then I'm going to show two ways to resolve that problem. And really this is focused on, it has to be fast, it has to be resilient, it has to be multi threading and how we can achieve this uh, with the library. So I don't know if you have questions so far. I hope I'm saying things, are, things right, but if not you can complain later to me. Okay, so that means that I'm going to show a demo. Yeah. Uh, so how can I watch my movies with this? <laughs> <laughs> That's so good, huh? Yes. You, you can try. <laughs> uh, okay, so again, what we're going to do is we're going to use the Marvel API, and it's something that uh, Matt Kessler from uh, from CapTech showed at, at the, uh, the JavaScript users group, and this is how I get to know the Marvel uh, API. Basically, Marvel has a RESTful API, it's really good. If you want to take a good example of what a RESTful API is, the Marvel API is a very, very good example. I say, okay, let's use that API to write something that I can show with this. And what we have to solve is the following. We have to create an endpoint 
that sets up to four characters, like Iron Man, Spider-Man, is just one Marvel character you want to return. Then the endpoint is going to return a JSON, JSON is a string, and with the following information, it has to return the character ID, the name, the description, and just an image, a little image of that character. And then it has to also contain information about a comic where that character has been. In this case, we're going to return the title, the price, and again, a little image of that comic. And we know that the Marvel API client is already built, so we don't have to code that. And the last requirement is it has to be fast. How many times we hear that? It has to be fast. So, okay, let's see what we can do about that. I'm going to introduce another Netflix <coughs> project that is called Fame. Fame is basically a REST client that is really cool. It's not very powerful uh, 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 as if you say I want to use a uh, REST template from Spring or, or many other different libraries, but it's, it's, it's really easy to use. We have to define an interface, and then you have to annotate the methods with, I want to make a get to this particular API endpoint, and I have parameters, in this case it's the main, and then it's just binding that Pass with the name that we pass in the parameter, and it's going to return a map string object. And that is because Java, JSON, the, the basic representation of JSON is a map, and then the same for the comic. So we know that to get a comic, I need to make a call to the first endpoint to get the character ID, and then I need to make a, a, a call to the second endpoint with a character ID to get the, the comic information. So that means that if we want to, to get four characters, we have to make four calls to that API to get the information. And that is what I'm going to do. I'm going to create a, a, a proxy. If the fan is creating a proxy from that interface, you just say, okay, from that class, I want a proxy. So I have the API. And I'm going to say, I want to operate in called Iron Man and Beast. I want those uh, in Marvel character. And then for each one of those, you're going to get the name, call the API. And this is not an uh, observable. This, this is just good way. Uh, uh, use that API to find a character by name. And then, because this is Groovy, JSON is really simple to use. And, and also with the map, then you, know, you have to do this data, first call, first ID. And then you're going to give me the ID, and then the second call is just using that ID. So let's see how much time it takes to execute that. Well, if the Wi-Fi is working, we're going to get something. <coughs> Just a little while ago. Let me <coughs> okay, it was slow. So it took a lot of time, almost one minute to get. So remember that I said that when you when you just use threads then you are using the app server thread pool to connect to, well, not, well yes, the thread pool of the app server to connect to different uh, resources. Like in this case, we're using the Nano, except that it means that it's a Tomcat thread to call this Marvel API. I think we're wasting resources because those threads should be to serve requests to that API, not to call the Marvel API. So that is one of the issues. Then, you can see that we're just basically fetching everything synchronous, and it took a lot of time to do that. And maybe the one page is going back at home was taking like seven seconds. But anyway, it's, it's a lot of time. And so let me show you that this is synchronous. You're just using the same set, the exact one, just different code, getting the, uh, the characters, then stealing the characters, finally getting to the comics, blah, blah. We get the results. Okay, but the requirement was it has to be fast. Well, let me just try again. It might be faster now. Faster. That's fair. It's now taking like almost four seconds. So let's see the, the, the other example. 
<coughs> now this is using the observable API. I just removed the, uh, the interface because it's the same thing. We have an observable, and we're gonna request the same uh, character name. But in this case, I'm going, I'm mapping everything that I need in that requirement. So you can see that I have the first map is the ID, the name, the description, the thumbnail, and then the second call to the uh, API is the comic title, price, and thumbnail. So this is doing all that we had to do in that, in that requirement using that RF shell. Another thing that you can, you can get from here is that I'm using the command. Like I said in those examples, it was getting a little bit better, better and better until you get the history. And I'm using the command. <coughs> so let's see how much time. Well, for, for a second it was almost the same thing, but the second time is really like nothing. Maybe the first time because of the resources, that, that's why I wanted to try in the previous example. The first time was almost a minute, and then the second time like four seconds. So the same thing here. The difference now is that I'm not using the ad server thread pool. I'm using the thread pool that I'm defining in that command. And because I'm using that thread pool, I can, like uh, I was saying, you can define different timeouts for that command. And you can allocate different resources, amount of resources for that specific call. So now that it's taking, it is really, it is really fast compared to what we were doing in the uh, uh, procedural way. And now it is asynchronous. So you don't have to worry about threads. You don't have to worry about a uh, multi threading because you are not doing that. It's the library doing that. So you have to worry about being declarative and expressing what you have to do and then just execute. So what if I change what I cannot do it because it's going to The last thing I want to show is like in that uh, figure that we got from Netflix. You can say, I want to allocate resources to this dependency and a resource to that other dependency. So I'm gonna change that. I don't want to use the same thread pool for the character score that for the uh, comics score. Maybe because the character calls is more used because you get more information about that. You need to know the ID. So what I'm going to do is just change the command name. Basically, I have this. I don't know character. I already have this command in, in the class, but that's why this is working. But the only thing that is changing is I'm defining a different group for that left pool. And then the same for this one. Now I have the character left pool. It's going to use, yes, it's using the four threads because I have four characters. It, it depends, next it will handle that for you. So you can say, yes, it's using the four threads. And then you just get in the responses. And then for the uh, other calls, I'm using a different thread pool. It's a comic thread pool. <coughs> well, and this is something, let me see. Let me see. Well, so what is happening is that some of these characters don't have comics, so it's just failing with that exception. But let me find who we need to add. Let's see. Okay, anyway, I, I have something in there that might not be right when I change the character. It was working when I was using command. But I think you get the idea that it's simple to use thread. It's much faster than just being synchronous, and it's easy. I hope this looks easy. <coughs> so in Java, this might be like 100 lines of code, maybe more, I don't know. This is just 21, but it, that is a different uh, uh, error. So now that we have built this API, we can show a demo of that. This is, oh, this is too loud, but anyway. 
that is too large. So this is when you're returning from IPA the DOM name. This is what I'm showing. And it's just to prove that, okay, we can connect, we're getting information. So that's it, that's all I have. I don't know if you have questions or... Question. Yes. When you mentioned Netflix, are we talking about the company Netflix and are they, how do they use reactive programming? One example they, they like to do is, for example, when you have with your dashboard for movies, mm -hmm. it's the same like <coughs> doing. You, you, they have to get your user ID. Okay, now right. you have the user ID, let's fetch the movie. But those movies may have descriptions, they may have more information about the movie, mm -hmm. so they want to render that in the dashboard. When we then they do that, and you may not, you may not notice that, is that if there is an error, you are not going to get all the full list of movies. You may get only like 100 out of 200 if that happens. So basically they are... So they're grabbing your list first. Yes, yes, yeah. and then by using observables inside observables, like this example, they are using multiple places to fetch the data that they need to show you. And then they're saying, okay, if there's an error, then instead of showing an error, it's very there's only like 100 movies out of 200 that showing not nothing. But yeah, they use this not not for the streaming of the movie. This is really for the application, like the console, Netflix, the app, console, the, uh, the iPhone app, things like that. So then, if I select a particular movie, I want to see the details of that movie, whether it's in my list or suggested for you or whatever list they generate. Yeah. Are they doing another call, reactive call? Well, or in, in that in, something else? in that one, I don't know because uh, I know what they put in, 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 in on the internet, so I know that that is kind of the right. use case. So yes, in, in maybe in some, in all the, yes, in maybe that sounds like a similar use case. You have to fetch data to know an ID. Maybe that collection of movies that you have dedicated just in that favorite, and then go, go and fetch the, the rest. So you're going from a published use case to actual, <laughs> actual documentation of the responsible. Yes. Okay, cool. I wasn't sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm on Okay, the, the syntax the syntax looks different <coughs> from you know idiomatic data, right? Probably particular because you were using Ruby. Um, I mean, I can think of another option that provides <coughs> some of the same uh, benefits uh, to scale up, mm -hmm. even with ACA as the framework. Also, if I'm still going to have to learn a different way to program this and declare it, et cetera, et cetera. Why should I move to this rather than scale up, for example? Oh, but you mean in specific to Groovy? No, 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 the no, not in specific to Groovy, I mean. Okay, I know, you with, said with 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 Rx. Rx. Yeah, okay. Rx. And, and now that you mentioned that, it's important to mention as well that that reactive manifesto, mani manifesto group of people is not just Netflix. A Spring has a project called Reactor, mm -hmm. Scala has Actors, and there are like other two that I don't remember that are working together to define what this should be, what the specific specification of observables should be. Microsoft is the other company, and actually it's bad to say that, but this started in Microsoft. Microsoft basically created that reactive extension, and then Netflix kind of trying to uh, implement that in the company, uh, uh, it created that in Java, but this started at Microsoft. So Microsoft is one of those companies. They are working together to define the spec and basically defining what is a reactive programming or reactive system. But, uh, so I, I don't know, I, I, can, I, I can answer about uh, ACA because I, I like Scala, but I haven't tried like, be, like using libraries or, or trying to solve uh, issues like that. Uh, so, uh, Reactor is another way to think. Uh, it's, it's a very nice project from Spring, but I, I like RxJava better because, because the reason I do is case fix. The project reactor from Spring doesn't have that feature on top of RxJava. Kisik is on top of RxJava, mm -hmm. and that gets a lot of uh, plus to the to that implementation of Netflix. Just a follow up. You mentioned the the use cases. Where can one find those use cases? I'm sorry. Where can you find? Where could I maybe? Ah uh, yes, find? that is. I can. Uh, I can share. I, I'm planning to share the presentation. Like basically, it's in the GitHub. They, they have the documentation in the GitHub, give an example, the, the images that I show is in GitHub. They explain another okay. concept like circuit breaker and, and, and timeouts in, in the different dependencies. So they have a lot about uh, also information about that. It's public in, in the GitHub. And also, right. Netflix has the Netflix open source blog. 
They call it the uh, Netflix ecosystem, where they put all the libraries together, like Fame. Uh, there are like, I don't know how many, they have like maybe 20 open source libraries by GitHub, and they have that blog where they talk about how you can integrate the right app and think that together. Yeah, I'm not sure. Just like, just like FedEx has their use cases available and different functionality available on their website and so forth. It's from different websites. Yes, I know if you're going to find what you're looking for, but it's a good place to start the next edition. It's a good reading, I think, on a, on a rainy, cold night. <laughs> Thank you. I have one more question. I'm sure. Um, just what was the text editor you used? That was a re really good way to demonstrate. What is the what, what was it like text editor used for the compiling uh, and everything I wrote else? it. I'm using Shower. Shower is a, a library to use uh, to, to create presentations. But that text editor is Ace. Well, sorry, yeah. Uh, when I say I wrote it, it's wrong. It's the Ace text editor. Basically, I'm I just wrote the integration so I can pull that editor uh, code and the, the service same code, execute code, get a response. So, and behind that, I use an Spring Boot. I'm going to publish the project in my open in my GitHub account, so you are interested in learning what is behind this presentation. Okay. Yeah, it's really good. Thanks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. Well, thank you very much, Manuel. Okay. So we have a a uh, Amazon cards raffle, and uh, thirty dollars worth of cards. So I'll tell you what, Emmanuel, why don't you tell us who the lucky winner is? Okay. Go ahead. Pick a card. So the number is eight, eight, nine, three, one, eight. Uh -huh. nice. There we go. Yeah. Yeah.